Good morning, everybody. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Bobby, take over for one second. Hey, good morning, everybody. <laughs> Blake, uh, Blake tried to, he's trying to come off the bench, but we may have to put in the right hander. Uh, Blake uh, still got a frog in his throat. Uh, this is the Caffey and Football uh, Friday morning live stream. Uh, I've got uh, myself, Bobby Burton, along with Blake Monroe uh, and Jerry Hamilton. Jerry, you're out in Phoenix this morning, so it's already has it even has it even cracked dawn today? Uh, you're out there uh, on a volleyball trip with uh, a significant other uh, right now. Uh, so what's what's going on out there for you, buddy? Yeah, man, just kind of doing a little, uh, you know, spring. Uh, got my my sons out here with me. Actually, we see the Arizona State, see the stadium in the background here. Um, I, I think they they all leave to go on their vacations this afternoon. Uh, they're a little different as far as the, you know, Texas coaches, some are out of the country, some are on vacation, obviously Sark stuck around. Uh, but yeah, just, uh, you know, gonna, uh, yeah, have a little fun with my son here on this spring break too. And, uh, you know, I'm going to take in a spring training baseball game later today, Phoenix Coyotes game Saturday. I've never been to a pro hockey game, so I'm excited about that. That sounds, that sounds fun. It's good. I'm glad Jez, Jezik is going to get a chance to do that. Um, uh, also today, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the upcoming uh, spring ball. We've got uh, Texas with spring ball starting. Uh, we got the official date. We knew it was March 19th. We didn't know exactly when uh, Steve Sarkeesian and his crew would go uh, and take care of things. And that's going to be at 9 a.m. on March 19th. That's this coming Tuesday. Uh, so that is there. Uh, the timing also for the uh, uh, for the situation as far as the NFL Pro Day is going to be the following afternoon. Uh, so we've got a bunch of stuff to talk to talk about today as well as we're going to have two guests, one Nick Shuley, uh, who's the creator of Third and Longhorn, a good friend of ours. Uh, he'll be on to talk about his programs. Uh, we love that stuff, and uh, I think it's an opportunity for people to see uh, and hear behind the scenes some Longhorns uh, there, as well as we're going to have Drew Bishop, the former athletic director of operations for baseball, the Longhorns host Washington later today uh, in a three-game series that starts later this evening. Uh, at the dish. Uh, Blake, you want to try to take back over and ask people where they're from and what coffee they're drinking yeah. today? You want to think you got it now? I don't know. Please tell us where you're checking in from, what you're drinking this morning. Let's talk spring football. All right, let's, let's do that. Let's do that. Jerry, take it away. Yeah, so uh, so I want we wanted to give you guys a look at all the spring football game dates of the tech on the Texas schedule next year. Of course, Vanderbilt won't drop a date. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Maybe they figure more people are going to be at a baseball game. Uh, but uh, uh, there you see, and a lot of these schools, Georgia already in the spring practice, right? I mean, oh, Florida well in the spring practice. I think they started March 6th. Uh, but then you see, and this is key just to get a look at, get a feel for the spring games. Also, you know, that competition in recruiting, you know, Oklahoma, Texas and Texas A&M have their spring game on the same date. So everybody's uh, competing to get guys on campus that weekend. I think that's why you see Texas having a big April 6th weekend as well, kind of get some of those kids on campus because you know you can't get every kid on campus for your spring game. Uh, so, you know, that's why you have the two, three dates, and Texas has some guys coming in that next weekend, April 13th, 14th. Some of those guys are like a Fahim Delane out of uh, Good Counsel, one of the top safeties in the country, a major Preston out of IMG. Um, and, and, you know, then you have the 20, 26 offensive line guys like John Turntine uh, and the, kid, the the monster up in uh, Euless Trinity. So I think this is kind of – we wanted to – so you guys could see, okay, this is when the spring games are for all of Texas competition, if we wanted to talk about that all the, on the schedule next year. And then also – that's the competition in recruiting. Everybody tries to get kids that are spring game. Uh, you know, like Georgia is April 13th. LSU spring game, same date, right? Uh, Notre Dame's is obviously on April 20th as well. So a Damian Shanklin, who Texas is trying, is trying, has an official visit scheduled with out of Indianapolis, Warren Central. He's already scheduled to be at Notre Dame. He's a Notre Dame lean. So it's just a look at the Texas schedule. Um, again, kind of the spring uh, practices, who's begun, what when these spring games are, and kind of how it ties in the recruiting, Bobby. Uh, yes, and, and I would say this, the one that, you know, just immediately striking – the traditional team, two traditional teams that Texas fights the most in recruiting are OU and AM. Yeah. And to your point, OU, AM, and Texas all on April 20th. Yeah. 
Um, and I will say that we've talked about it before. Kids vote with their feet a little bit yeah. early in the process. So if someone goes to Texas and not A&M or someone goes to A&M and not Texas, when they haven't been the other place for these spring games, same with Oklahoma, yeah, it tells you a little something about where they think they're situated right now, unless unless they haven't been to the other places as many times. Correct. You understand that and agree with that, Jerry? Yep. yep. And so Texas, Texas A&M and OU all having their spring games simultaneously on the same day, et cetera, that is going to speak to some recruiting nuggets that you can kind of look behind the scenes and get it get a gauge of when you're talking about florida and georgia um those are different i mean if lsu were on the 20th also you could tell right. a bit, you can read a little bit into that but uh really ou and AM and texas all at the same time you know it's going to be up to texas coaches to get these guys on campus uh, i do think that they're going to have a, a really good turnout uh in fact i, I think that texas um, is the kind of it school right now among those three, but they have to go out and do it now. The coaches and, have and, to- and, and also Texas is focused April 6th on some of these kids too, as much or more in the spring game. Uh, and like a Michael Fasusi's coming in on April 9th, not around a scrimmage or visit weekend. So him and his family can spend a lot of time with the entire Texas offensive staff. Uh, uh, so that's kind of, there's so many ways you play it. In recruiting that April 6th weekend, guys, I, I made a, po- uh, a post and updated kind of list at on Texas football earlier this week. There's going to be 20 plus four star combined four star and five star prospects at that April 6th spring practice, spring scrimmage, whatever that ends up being. So Texas is treating that almost like an official visit weekend before the spring game in a way. Uh, so it's it, it, yeah, recruiting's about to get kick started. And again, I think one of the other things to talk about in terms of recruiting, Fahim Delane has never been on campus before. Major Preston has never been on campus before. Um, you have Hayden Lowe, uh, the edge out of Westlake Village, who's coming in April 6th and again in June for an official visit. So it's twofold. One, you got you getting kids on campus that have never been on campus before from out of state. And two, you're trying to get those kids on campus twice, however you can, once in the April window, around the spring practice or late March, Texas will start having some visitors next weekend of note, Brandon Brown, uh, that California power team, Josh Petty, offensive lineman out of the Atlanta area, several guys, um, Keone Armstrong, Javar Thomas from the night ride at seven on 17. So you want to get those kids on campus in April, get them back for an official visit. So this month, next month, you kind of get a feel for where you're truly at in that recruitment. And then you try to bring home the ones you want in late June. I love it. I, I love it because I think it sets up well for Texas. Yeah, That's the whole, you know, you, you've you got to, and I'll say this the right, I'll try to say it the right way. You have to capitalize on your advantages. Yeah. And Texas right now has an advantage based on not only their offensive style compared to the others, the, the, the consistency of the coaching staff, et cetera, but also because they won last yeah. year. So it's time to capitalize uh, you know, to the victor go the spoils is the old saying, right? Well, let, let's let's enjoy some of the spoils. I, yeah. I, I'm ready for Texas to capitalize in recruiting. Uh, insane now. Petty, 100% correct. Jamie French has never been on campus, Jacksonville Mandarin. He'll be on campus April 6th, then scheduled to be back for June 21st through 23rd official visit. Obviously, that's a big national battle over in Jacksonville, Ohio State, FSU, and about everybody else. All right. Before we move on, Bobby. Tell everybody about BKCW. <laughs> yes, Blake, Blake, you've got a frog in your throat, man. Uh, I'll tell you what, though, let's get it out with uh, BKCW. Uh, did you or your business have a frustrating insurance or empl- employee benefits renewal uh, around the new year? Most likely you didn't hear from the agent in all year, and then right before it was set to renew, they delivered the bad news of a rate increase or some kind of change that you weren't aware was going to happen. Uh, When this happens, the agent is providing no value and you're stuck in what we call the insurance trap. BKCW takes you out of the insurance trap by providing you with actual risk management consulting, not just price quoting. Uh, BKCW has already helped some of the most well-known construction companies, restaurant groups, breweries, and other small businesses in Central Texas escape the insurance trap. And it all starts with a free risk assessment. Go to bkcw.com 
or send an email info at bkcw.com to get started with a free risk assessment or claims audit and get yourself out of the insurance trap. Again, they can save you money uh, while keeping you apprised of your options all year long. Okay, guys, <laughs> I'm going to try. All right, let's see. We got time for questions. So let's talk. Let's take some questions. Yeah, James, Lee, James Lee's comment is hilarious. <laughs> Bobby brought him back from the tennis tournament in Palm Springs. He's still in the uh, Three. I don't even know. I don't. Hey, James, you're showing your age by remembering what Virginia Slims are. By the way, I don't even know if they make those anymore. No, Blake man. sounds like he's smoking three packs of Virginia Slims. <laughs> hey, hey, uh, I, I think it's that pollen. It's starting, uh, yeah. to, starting to pop up. Uh, I started getting my little scratchy throat yesterday as well. So, uh, Blake, we hope you start feeling better, buddy. Uh, and get uh, that out. Hey, but hey, you look, yeah, look good. You you look good. You may not sound good, but you look good. You, you got right. what Deion Sanders message does. Look good, <laughs> feel good, play good. That's right. He's got that 40 Acres Collection uh, sweatshirt on. Uh, that little light polo yeah. thing. Yeah. Those are nice. Very, very uh, yeah. nice. Hey, um, I, I want to talk about the, a little something else, Jerry, that, that we brought up and have talked a little bit about as it relates to recruiting. Is, is there right now, do you sense that there is any kind of, I, I don't sense there's any kind of panic from Steve Sarkeesian no. as it relates to recruiting or his staff. I mean, that that's not, I mean, they're on vacation, like you said, right now. Right. Um, wh where do you feel like Texas is right now overall in recruiting as they look towards the next month or two where recruiting along with uh, frankly, along with spring practice, along with the portal coming up, that all takes center stage. Where, where do you think they are overall? Well, I think that this staff is um, going to deal with something. It, it, Kyle flood dealt with it last year a little bit. I think the Texas staff as a whole is going to deal with something in this class that they haven't had to success. Success means a lot of really good players, three straight top five classes in a row. Where do I fit in? What are my expectations? How soon do I get to hit the field? That's the 25 class. That's the thing. That's new to Texas. Because when they came in, the program was, eh, you know, Sark sold the early playing time, the ability to come in and make a difference, which you still can do. You just get more questions now. Because when a team's five and seven, Kelvin Anybody Banks, can play. <laughs> Kelvin, Kelvin Banks, DJ Campbell, everybody looked at that and said, yeah, I, I can do it. I can go in there and I can compete, you know. Um, so, I mean, the, you know, Quinn with the quarterback situation, right? I mean, if you're transferring back, you know, Texas was very favorable position for Quinn to come in, right? So uh, somebody's saying Quinn's having fun in Turks and Caicos. I hope he does. Uh, that's awesome for those kids. I've seen a lot of kids like in Jamaica as well on social media, but I think that's what the Texas staff is dealing and they'll be fine because it plays in, it plays in the Sark's long game recruiting strategy, which yeah. he's been very successful at. They don't, there's no panic with the Texas recruiting staff. Um, they are aggressive, long-term aggressive, not short-term aggressive, try to get these guys in the boat. Uh, they want, I, they want to, this spring evaluation period's big. I mean, you see a lot of guys, well, what are 32 official visitors on our list on ontexasfootball.com now? 32. And it's going to go to 45, 50. Uh, but here's the thing. That doesn't mean all those guys are absolute takes right now either. They're going to go watch these guys again in the spring practice or in workouts and athletic period. I think Texas is in a great spot. They just have to answer new questions that they hadn't had to answer previous in recruiting. Which is here's a great one, thing, by the way. Here, here's one thing I would, I would, I think it's really interesting. A lot of people may remember Steve Sarkeesian um, as the Alabama offensive coordinator, right? Yeah. Okay, and that that's definitely valuable experience for him, et cetera. But I think back to Pete Carroll, um, with, which was his original quote unquote mentor, and Pete Carroll when he took over USC was not unlike what Texas was when Steve Sarkeesian took over Texas. Yeah. Okay. And they started out by kind of trying to get as good a player as they could and then lifting that program up. And then over time, they had to, they had to answer the same questions that Steve Sarkeesian is now going to have to answer, which is 
okay, can, you know, what's the value of going in and, and waiting your turn versus playing immediately? I want to play right away, et cetera. And I think uh, he's had experience doing that. I know he has. And so I think that that gives me some uh, uh, comfort uh, as, as it relates to that. But to your point, Jerry, I don't, I don't sense it. I asked about panic. I just don't sense it. Uh, no. I've sensed it before. You're believe right. me. <laughs> I know what it feels like. Um, but I, I think that they're just rested and uh, trying to figure out who they want exactly. They're going to interview these guys when they get on campus. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. I mean, it's not just a one-way street where we're going to just go all in on these guys. They, it's, a, it's an interview process to some level. Yes. Uh, so, so we'll figure that out. In, in, uh, well, well, Bobby, Bobby, let's also add this. that's so key in recruiting. We talked about this. Way back after the, the a win over Alabama, if Texas followed through and had a really good season, which they did, I think I just gleeked on the board, by the way, um, <laughs> so, um, which I haven't done since, I don't know, eighth grade. Um, so I, I think the, the key was we talked about what if Texas went on and had a really good season and they had a great season. I mean, they made the college football playoff, right? Short of winning a national championship, you had an amazing season uh, after eight and five. We knew Texas would be able to get more guys on campus. And that's what you're seeing. You're going to see, yeah, I mean, you, Damian Shanklin from Warren Central, schedule an official visit. Throw out the Cali guys, but more Cali guys are interested. I think that's also coupled with USC, UCLA, Oregon going to the Big Ten. Do you want to play in the Big Ten? Do you want to play in the SEC? I think those moves opened up California even more for Texas. But think about the kids in the Southeast. The kids in Virginia, Texas has two guys from Virginia coming in in April. I mean, they're entering some new territory here, and that's what beating Alabama on that national stage, staying in the national limelight all year, making a college football playoff. Now you're about to have all these guys drafted. This is kind of what we were talking about was going to happen. Now Texas gets to evaluate more football players in person, and I don't think we can stress that enough how important that is because Nick Saban, the biggest advantage to come coming with winning at the highest level for Nick Saban for 15 years, he got every kid to campus he wanted. He got to evaluate them on the field and through a conversation and with their parents or people in their circle. That makes for a hell of an evaluation process. It, it really does. And that, that harkens back to something I saw firsthand back in the aughts, basically. Uh, I, uh, Jerry, you remember uh, Justin Warren out of, uh, I think it was Tyler Lee at the time, yeah. and Tim Crowder out of uh, John Tyler. Yeah. Were, they were both defensive end edge types coming out the very same, same year. Justin Warren had better tape than Tim Crowder as a high school junior. No I doubt about it. Highly that. ranked. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was high, more highly rated, all that stuff. Both of those go down, guys go down to Texas the very same weekend. Texas reprioritizes Crowder ahead of Justin Warren. And the 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 recruiting gurus were like, whoa, what, what, why is Texas, you know, well, Texas saw both of them in person and like and like Tim Crowder much more. And yeah. Tim Crowder's the one that ended up having the multi-year NFL career, yeah. won a national championship, et cetera. So I mean, that's that that's the value. People ask, well, what you know, we can all. That's the value. You get a real look under the hood right. of these guys and how they how they manage themselves, how they how they uh, uh, handle success, how they handle failure, how they compete. That's really a big one for me. Whenever you start putting up these uh, top guys, all right, yep. hey guys, we're gonna invite in one of our friends, uh, the creator of on our right, creator of uh, Third and Longhorn, Nick Shuley. Nick, how you doing this morning, buddy? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Thanks for having me. We're not talking oh, we're basketball. We're happy to, yeah, we're happy to hear see you here, dude. You're you're uh you're looking pretty sly with that haircut, man. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, nothing nothing gets more hate on the show than my hair. So it is. Uh, I, I uh, luckily I was raised in a family where that's their uh, their form of love is uh, making fun of you, so it doesn't really bother me. <laughs> I, I, when I said Nick is, we're not talking basketball. So uh, that so I'm not. <laughs> we're gonna we'll save that for another time. Uh, Keep it happy. Said, hey, hey, Colton said. Colton said, "Love the Colin Simmons interview." I was going to go right into that. What were your takeaways? Because look, you got a chance to sit down with him, and I had to, and I got had a chance to multiple times in the recruiting process. You have now for the first time. What were your takeaways? Man, he is—he's one of those kids that has 
he has so much confidence, but it never comes across as cocky, if that makes sense. Like you, you just believe what he's saying. It's like it reminds you of when Michael Parsons talks or or a lot of the folks he gets compared to. He's just he has this amazing confidence. He knows his ability. He's like he's grown into who he is, is what it seems. And Jerry, you you've known him obviously way longer. Has has he always been that? Like, has he been on the radar since he's in seventh grade? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think end of his freshman year, you know, really, I think at Duncanville, if you're a really, really good freshman, because every college, major college comes through. So they're doing the same thing I am. Who's the next guy, Coach Samples? Well, I got this defensive end kid that has a chance to be a really big time player. Uh, but I think Colin is always the one thing about Colin, I think he's street smart. I think he's always understood the process of recruiting, um, how to present himself. Um, and, I, and the guys that understand that, I think, at a young age, that they, they tend to do pretty well. Yeah. It's because I mean, there, is an, there is an understanding and art to it. Right, Bobby? Yep, absolutely. Hey, hey uh, Nick, I got to ask you a question. When, how did you come up with the idea for third and Longhorn? Because I love it. I think it's great. Man, it it actually pretty much has nothing to do with me. I I known Jeremy Hills for years, and so Jeremy and I go way back to. He actually used to train Lance Armstrong when I worked with Lance, so that's how I originally met him. Of course, knew who he was, knew who his brother was, and we got to be good friends. And it, I think it was it wasn't last season, but the year before, it, we were over at his gym, the Collective in Austin, and he was just talking football with another one of his buddies then Kenny Vaccaro rolls in who works out at the gym everybody's just talking football and I was like you guys need your own show like that you know it's these former players talking about it and uh and they were like yeah let's do it let's do it so we get people together I forget who we had on the first we filmed a couple a couple things and I forget who it was but one person didn't show up and Hills is like okay you're running the show and I was like dude I have no business being on this at the time I was doing you know, Clark Field Collective, help them put together some of the one fun stuff and all that. And uh, I was like, man, I have no business being on the show. And Hills was like, well, we're not doing it if you're not on there because you're going to suffer just like we do. And so we filmed a couple episodes. Honestly, nothing ever came of it. And then last year, we kind of taught what as things obviously the season was going re really nicely. Hills was like, let's fire that thing back up. And so, you know, I'd, I'd gotten to know Derek through that i got to know rod through you know just through the radio stuff and and you know and just it just kind of came together oak four got involved and and i don't know it's been it's been fun man it's it's just it's awesome to listen to those guys talk i i just sit there and kind of hang out because i'm like this is the best front row seat ever to listen to these guys interview these kids have you have you had one in particular that you really 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 liked and, and enjoyed and thought the story behind it all was just fascinating David Benda blew me away. I don't necessarily know that it was the story, but just how he carries himself, who he is. And the only thing I truly, I mean, obviously I'd watched him play, but the only thing I really knew about him coming in was I remember his quote after OU, after the OU game where he said, that's on me. And he didn't, didn't say, Hey, this could have been the coverage handoff. This could have been, uh, you know, this or that it was, this is on me. And this is the, the, like, I'll take the blame for this. And so I, I, I already knew, kind of who he was as a person but just listening to him talk was was really really cool I, I honestly I'm I I love Burt Auburn so I was so excited to have Burt on there because you know the kickers the punters they get that rap as the kind of the guys who are out there and and Burt did not disappoint Burt's hilarious uh well also it's somebody else's hair is the focus at that <laughs> point <laughs> I get to take a back seat finally. I don't get the – actually, Bert gets no hate on his hair. So that's like – that's his trademark. <laughs> hey, Nick, I got a question for you living in Austin. What's it like there now compared to the last few years? Fo spring football's four days away. I Man. would sense there's more excitement on a day-to-day -day basis about Texas football, obviously, than there's been in over a decade. Yeah, easily. I, I, I would call it almost – it's crazy to to think about where we were before last season, you know, yeah. talking about this is the year, this is the year Sark has to prove himself. We don't know what's going to happen. Big 12 or bust kind of thing. And then to go to fast forward to now, it's almost, it's almost scary to the point where I almost am like trying to level set with people of uh, for next season, because it, it's like, it's turned into the, back when we used to, you know, when things were rolling under Mac, where it's just like that, you know, we're, we're going to go undefeated and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, guys, slow oh, down. Yeah. This thing, this is, we're playing an NFL schedule next year. So, and 
the nice thing is with the expanded playoff, it, I think I think things are going to look a lot different. I, I think college football is shifting more towards not saying we're going to lose two or three games next year, but I still think you you'll get a two or three loss team likely in that in that playoff. I agree, hundred percent. And that's you know, there's been a lot of discussions about. Well, some people don't like where college football's headed. I love where college football's headed for the simple fact that in the last how many years, if you weren't a fan of Alabama, Clemson, Georgia, Ohio State, how much hope did you have? That's a, yeah. that's a great point. If you're NC State and have a 10-2 and two season in the ACC next year by chance, you're in the playoff. Yeah. NC State fans have a reason to care if you win. And here's the other thing. If you lose a game early next year, it doesn't knock you out. There's been some years where you're like, eh, well, I mean, season's over in that regard if you had those expectations. I think what's going on now, and just with March Madness right here, you get to see it in bright lights. More fan bases have uh, made. I, I agree. It's the best time to be a Texas fan. We're sitting kind of in the we're in the catbird seat here, man. We are, you know, we're sitting pretty. We have a great city, a great program, a great coach. And the and the more and more I get to know them, amazing kids. And you see the program and you see the people. And I think we're in the right spot. I can see though the other side, but my family went to Washington State. And they you yeah. talk about you talk about getting in the, the the short end of this thing. They're trying to figure out if they can find a conference, you know, that that side of it. But, you know, back to us, it's the right time to be us. That's what my cousins were saying. They're like, man, we're so jealous. We used to be excited <laughs> about football. <laughs> well, look, so for instance, for instance, I'm here and uh, I, I can see Arizona State Stadium from my hotel uh, balcony. OK. A 10 and two season in the Big 12 by Kenny Dillingham at some point. I'm not saying next year. At some point, he's in the playoff. When is Arizona State – when's the last time they had any hope in football? Yeah. that's the. So when people say college football, we're headed to a terrible place, I think we're, I think we're headed to a great place. We just got to get there. Yeah, we're going to get some Cinderella's. We're going to get some of those stories. You know, in college football, we I mean, we don't really get the Cinderella. Every right. once in a while you get the Boise States, but it was never – they were never in danger of winning the whole thing kind of, you know? And so I think this is, you're, you're totally right, Jerry. This is, it is, it's, I I'm the most excited I've ever been. Yeah. The game shifted. Lots of things have changed, but it is, it's, 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 it's just fun to be a college football fan, man. It's you're getting me excited. We, and, and I, we're not even on the spring game yet. So. <laughs> hey, hey Nick, before we let you go, thank you for joining us, by the way, that's third Longhorn Nick Shuley, creator of it joined by guys like our Rod Babers. Uh, as well as Alex Okafor, Derek Johnson, Jeremy Hills from time to time. You got a, a, a true cast of Longhorn characters on that show. It's just uh, tremendous. Uh, what do you got planned? Fozzie. What do you got in the hopper? What do you got coming? Uh, and who? Don't forget Fozzie. He'll kill me. Oh, Fozzie. Oh, yes. Fozzie. Fozzie. <laughs> no, you cannot forget Fozzie. I, my apologies. Um, <laughs> hey, uh, uh, Nick, what do you guys got planned in the hopper coming up uh, for that people can uh, be excited about? Yeah, we got we got some cool ones coming up. We got Alfred Alfred Collins has, has already come on. We taped his. We taped Baron Sorrell's, Leonga Lafau, and then last this past weekend at South by the UT folks asked us to to do a live taping at the Hookem House, which was fun. It was it was definitely interesting to to kind of shift the environment and not do it in our little you know studio, but it, it was great, man. And we had Quandre Diggs on, and that was cool to hear. We had, we actually reached out to Quandre. It was the day he was cut, and it was no lie. Ten minutes before he was cut, Fozzie texted him and said, "Hey, you want to come on the show?" Quandre's like, "Let's do it." And then ten minutes later, I texted Fozzie the tweet that you know Diggs had been cut, and I was like, "Man, you think Diggs is gonna still do it?" And, and Fozzie's like, "I think he'll still do it." He texts him five seconds later. Diggs hits back. He's like, "I'm in." And man, he was listening. <laughs> that one blew my mind because you listen to to a professional, you know, look, they're superior athletes already, but listening to them talk football and listening to like Rod and Derek Johnson talk, you know, coverages and, and just everything they do. It, I mean, I thought I knew football and I'm like, man, I'm, I, I'm at like, I'm at like high school level compared. They're in the graduate, you know, master's degree. It was pretty impressive. Nick, Nick to your point on Quandre, I, I covered him at Angleton in high school. We had him in the Under Armour All-America game. The, what, what you talked about, mm -hmm. oh, we, I think we lost Nick there. But what Nick was talking about with Colin Simmons, Quandre was like when he was 16 years old. Same thing.
Quandre's always been a professional at a young age. When you talk, and maybe it's because Quentin Jammer, right, is his brother. But when I talk to Quandre at a young age, he seemed like a professional at 16. So those guys never surprised that those they end up making it and learn, understanding how to maximize their talent. All right, looks like we lost Nick, uh, but he he came in uh, for a little bit there. Hopefully, he uh, I'll talk to him later today and say thank you again uh, as well. Nick is someone that I got to know about a year and a half, two years ago, right when, uh, frankly, right when uh, the NIL started. Uh, he was helping start the Clarkfield Collective, uh, and uh, Nick, a great guy, great Longhorn. Appreciate him uh, being on with us this morning, right, Jerry. I'm going to pitch it to you now and let you do your morning commercial from Mando. You know, you know what I didn't forget on this trip? Man, that Mando, that deodorant, right? <laughs> My guys, you, know, you ever lift a little too hard or just forget to apply your daily deodorant and get hit by a truckload of BO from all directions? By the way, like TCU basketball going 17 to 73 from the floor yesterday. Does that three-in-one shampoo leave you needing a second shower just a few hours after the first? From the founders of Lume, Mando Whole Body Deodorant is helping men conquer their odor in a new way. Formulated with mandelic acid, Mando has a long-lasting 72-hour odor control that actually stops odor before it starts. Best part is you can put Mando everywhere. Pits, packages, feet, skin folds, back, knees, everywhere. To top it off, Mando's cologne quality scents were created with men in mind. Pro tip, try their best-selling scent, bourbon leather. It's a game changer. Only time bourbon for breakfast may be good, by the way. Once you <laughs> experience fresher underarms, a fresher package, and fresher feet, you'll never go back. Special offer, new customers get $5 off a starter pack with our exclusive code and link. Use on Texas, all caps, at shopmando.com shopmando.com tcu basketball you needed some mando last night <laughs> hey by the way the only time bourbon is good for breakfast I, I would say i would i would say some people disagree with you because i saw some at the kansas state game this year <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they had bourbon with donuts so <laughs> that was that was their comment that was their comment in the uh the uh pre-game tent tailgate area by the uh, way, Ski, yeah. Ski Breck, no, that's not – I was not joking. TCU shot 17 of 73 against U of H yesterday in a game. Man. I don't know if I could shoot 17 of 73 without – with with. I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 that's that's bad, Jerry. That Have you – I mean, we're, we're – uh, is that less than 25%, I guess, or right at it? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that's that, that's in the 20, that's in the twenty three percent category. I'm pretty sure without looking. Cool. Uh, Edmund Lee, OTF up to thirty eight nine k, about to go over thirty nine thousand. Thank you to everybody, man. Edmund, when you send out that super chat, when we're at ninety nine point nine k, it's going to be a hell of a super <laughs> chat, man. Thank you to all you guys. We couldn't do it without you. Obviously, it makes <laughs> makes it. There it is. Ski break twenty three point two. Uh, two of 20 from three, by the way. And out rebounded U of H 55 38. But I guess if you miss every shot, there's a lot of long rebounds. Uh, but I can't, you know, we're going to get out in the car. We got a lot going on this spring. We're going to go see all these kids are around the Southeast and uh, waking up every morning and, and bringing you all that information. A lot of fun. All right, guys. I'm going to try to, oh my gosh, try to talk here. Um, <laughs> we got Drew Bishop joining us for our baseball segment. Baseball this morning brought to you by Chinook Cedary, and I'm going to bring Drew in. <laughs> hey, how you doing, Drew? Good morning. How are y'all? You know, we're, we're having a little fun today. We just talked to Nick Shuley over at Third and Longhorn. We got Longhorn football starts back up on Tuesday. The basketball yeah. team went out unceremoniously uh, yep. on uh, Tuesday afternoon. Women won the, the Big 12 championship. How are things going over on the baseball diamond for the Longhorns right now? Well, you know, they had a great weekend coming off the winning the series out in Lubbock. Um, you know, with with everything that had gone on the weekend before, that I think that was huge for a number of reasons. So obviously, the confidence getting off to a good start in the Big Twelve is always important. Um, and now they get to you know kind of 
come home after an emotional series, have a get a big win on Tuesday against Incarnate Word and, you know, not necessarily take the weekend off, but re- relax a little bit with a non-conference series and kind of catch their breath before getting going back at back at it in Big 12. You, you mentioned that series they had uh, in Houston. Uh, it yeah. wasn't really a series. It was a tournament of sorts. Sure. They gave up two big leads. Yeah. Um, uh, one to a team, a Texas State team that's, you know, good good, t- good team, quality team, et cetera. But then yeah. to really crater against Vanderbilt like they did, that a lot of people took that as a sign that, hey, this team just doesn't have the pitching, period. Your, your thoughts on that right now? Because they did go out to Lubbock and prove themselves a little bit. Where, where are you at on 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 this on this team from that from that standpoint? Yeah, you know, I think you know what you got to do when you're looking at the course of the weekend is kind of evaluate how the whole thing went. You know, and there's certain teams each year that staying on script really matters. I mean, it's just like football a lot of times when you're talking about offense. But you know, on this side of things, you know, you look at it. LeBaron didn't go very deep on Friday against LSU and he didn't pitch poorly. Um, they just had a really good plan and that's one of the best offenses in the country. And they attacked that and they got him out of the game. Um, and so, you know, let him let us to go to the bullpen early and just kind of threw off the script for the entire weekend. And then you get in some of those high scoring games later in the weekend, you don't have some guys available. Um, and when you're thin in the bullpen and trying to figure out roles still uh, at this point in the season, that can be tricky. And I think that played a, a huge part in what happened. Um, you know, and then you turn around and flip it out last weekend in Lubbock and you get some good performances out of those guys out of the bullpen. You, you know, Ace Whitehead going out there and, you know, having an extended outing on on Friday night was huge you know, because it allowed you to save some guys for, for Saturday and Sunday and, you know, kept the guy like Gage Bain fresh, who was then able to finish it off on Sunday and go four innings to uh, to to get keep the win. So, you know, I think one thing that it looks like it's probably pretty clear is, you know, to win and keep winning at a high level for this team, they're going to have to stay on script. And, you know, a lot of that starts with how, how deep LeBaron's able to go on Friday. Um, and, you know, that's just – that's just the way this team's built right now. And there's still some guys that are trying to figure out roles in the bullpen too. You know, I think that's, that's something that, you know, that we've had years where you just knew once the starter came out, you know, who you were going to, you know, and, and once those roles are settled, it's, it's pretty easy and everyone's more comfortable in what they're doing. But when there's some inconsistency and guys still trying to figure out what their roles are in these teams, it it can be tricky. And it, and it's tough as as a coach to figure out who to put it put in when there when there's some inconsistency. You know, I think we battled that a little bit last year around this time of the year. Then we hit this stretch where it's kind of a, a lighter stretch for three weeks. Like last year it was about the same time too. And that's when we kind of hit our stride. So, you know, I, I think guys, you know, and we've had some guys banged up on on the mound a little bit. You know, Luke Harrison, David Shaw still coming back from um, from some offseason injuries. And, you know, so for some guys, it just takes more time than others. Um, and, but, you know, it's you know, Shaw's made right. You know, I think they're very confident in Luke Harrison still. And those guys haven't pitched as well as we expected uh, to this point. But I don't think by any means they've given up on them. And if those guys start turning in some good performances, this thing looks completely different. Uh, and, and, you know, it's funny, like, I, I'm i victim of this myself, but I, I was just – I hopped on, went to the Big 12 site to just kind of check the standings and see where people were at. You know, statistically, you know, it feels like the world is falling uh, with the pitching numbers. If you just look strictly at the numbers, but hey, like we're still fourth in the Big 12 when it comes to team ERA. Um, And so that bodes well, I think, for us. You know, the offense has been great. Uh, I think it's going to continue to get better. Uh, And when you look at the numbers of the other pitching staffs in the big 12, we're going to score a lot of runs. I think that things that's pretty certain. So um, as these guys continue to settle in, you know, I think LeBaron's going to be more than fine. I know we know what we've got in him and, you know, get him back at home uh, starting in hopefully what's better weather over the next couple of weeks too. Um, you know, I think that'll play a big role Just, I, it, it, but it will be critical to keep, keep him on script or keep the whole pitching staff on script starting with Friday. I think that'll be a bigger deal for this team maybe than some in the past, but 
um, you know, the, on the flip side, we'll be able to score some runs. So that's encouraging. Hey, Drew, hey, Drew, hey, Drew for, um, for the guys who are more casual baseball fans, right? Not mm-hmm. the diehard fans. Yeah. Why not want to get your thoughts on the move to the SEC next year? Because I think it's t- maybe tougher in baseball than any other sport. And yeah. two, who are the major players in NIL and college baseball right now? Because Texas fans know the major players in football. But I think outside of LSU, who are the major players in baseball right now? Yeah, so from an NIL perspective, uh, you know, the top of the SEC does a really good job. You know, obviously you mentioned LSU. Uh, A&M has done a really good job with it to this point. Uh, Ole Miss, Mississippi State, um, teams that really take the baseball serious. Florida, Florida, you know, it's, it seems like they've had a, a tough time on the football side with some of the collective stuff and issues they've had there. But that doesn't seem to be the case in baseball. Um, you know, you're you're obviously talking about different types of money when you're talking about football recruiting and baseball. Uh, and, and you know, to be fair, just like I think a lot of the football, I would say probably ninety percent of what you hear is going on on the NIL stuff probably isn't true, or is maybe a tad exaggerated. Um, you know, but where I think, you know, I think right now we would probably be middle of the pack low lower levels uh when it comes to the nil uh just strict volume wise um and everyone uses it uses it differently you know i think the the goal for texas has been to make as many guys whole as you can you know get them to where they're not having to pay anything and i think that's a healthy way to look at it um you know but at the same time you know if you're gonna have to be battling some of these schools in the portal for some of the the big time pitching that's where you're going to need to probably see a step up to really have a chance to get some of those guys, because, you know, it's, it, it's a different world. You know, th- those, they're kind of like viewed as quarterbacks, right? Like those are the, going to be the guys that are going to be getting the big money. I think, you know, I, it, from the, you know, with the COVID log jam that's still going on, you're still seeing those, some of these teams with 23, 24 year old guys. Yeah. And I think that's going to start, slowing down a little bit hopefully it does and i think you're going to see kind of a market correction in in that way you know some of these set teams are going out and getting 23 24 year old guys uh to catch you know and 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 that makes pitching tougher just because of the lineups and the experience like we have a couple guys like that in our lineup with guys like porter brown and jack o'dowd who've who've been there and been in these lineups for a long time and that just makes the pitching tougher and tougher because, you know, for some of some of those teams, those guys are down towards the bottom of the lineup and you're not getting a break, you know? And so, I mean, like I said, if you go around, if you go pull up the big 12 statistics, I mean, you've got half the league has team ERAs worse than a five, you know, I mean, Texas Tech's ERA is a team ERA is a six. Right. And so, you know, the game has changed a little bit with, having the older guys on the offensive side. Um, but I guess back to your original question, I think, you know, from an NIL standpoint, to be competitive, we're going to really need to step that up to get some of those premium premium pitchers that you're going to have starting on the weekends. Um, hey, like Paul Skeens uh, right. was a transfer, right, from Air Force. Right. To, he pitches LSU to the national championship type situation right. and uh, leaves after one year, but everybody remembers him in, LSU was well, sure. involved in that recruitment and lost out Yeah, uh, because of that. I mean, he had actually played a game at Texas the previous right. year and looked like a million bucks and may have gotten it from LSU. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, Blake, you had a question for, for, uh, uh, for uh, Drew yeah. as well. Hey, Drew, uh, <clears throat> I'll try to get it out here. We talk about pitching, but how concerned are you about the catcher position? Uh, you know, I, I think – that it probably hasn't been as good as we hope to this point. You know, I mean, you look at it, you go back to it. Kimball is still um, rather inexperienced while still being an older guy. Um, you know, and I, and I think that that leads to some of this. Uh, and and Ryland being out for a little while um, doesn't help. You know, I think some of these times when, you know, if a guy's struggling and he's hearing about it in the media and on Twitter and all this, like, you know, it's, it's impossible to be immune to it, you know, as much as you want to say, like it, it comes out. And then when you can't spell that guy or give him a day off when he's struggling, 
um, that can add to it. So I think getting Ryland back, getting him healthy and allowing him to catch some games, which hopefully it looks like, you know, I think we avoided a major catastrophe um, and it looks like Ryland will be able to get back behind the plate sooner rather than later, which I think will help uh, in a lot of ways, you know, and it's just for a lot of it, it's kind of like, it's a, it's a confidence thing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's tough, you know, and, it's tough when you kind of spiral like that and have some bad games, but you know, the, on the flip side, I think you have to commend him because it hasn't let him affect his offense. You know, he's, he's done a good job offensively and, and helped be a force there. And, you know, Ryland's kind of hit his stride offensively too over the last couple of weeks. So, you know, a lot of times the defense can carry over to the offense and vice versa. So hopefully with these guys getting more and more confidence from their offensive play, um ho- hopefully you see that spill it spill over to the to the catching side of it a little bit too usually it works the other way but i think that that you know that there's definitely a possibility of that happening as as the season goes and like you said i mean experience matters at that position so you know even though kimball is older he missed most of last year with with the injury um and so he's relatively young for college catching terms you know it's it, it's just one of those positions that reps are are what make you better and there's going to be some struggles for a lot of guys i mean shoot we went through it i mean cameron rupp played in the big leagues his first year was my senior year and it was like man like this guy like what are we doing but you know by the time he left he was one of the best defensive catchers that we had in a, for a long time and played in the big leagues um so it's it's a tough it's a tough spot you know i know you know i think he'd probably be the first to tell you that he wished he'd played a little bit better but you know, I think the hope is that you get both of those guys back in there, um, gives each of them a little bit of break. And and some of those guys just seem to – they catch different pitchers better than the other one, right? Yeah. So uh, – and you saw some of that early, early on. Like, you know, Ryland might catch this guy and Kimball might catch this guy. So that brings that back into the fold. You know, if you have a guy starting, it may make more sense to play Ryland one game or, you know, Kimball may just catch this guy different than the other. So – a lot of those little things can kind of factor in, um, but you know, it does, it, 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 it can be, it's, it's a lonely feeling. I don't know if you guys remember 2019 when we lost DJ Petrinsky, uh to a shoulder injury early in the season. And then, you know, Michael McCann went from being a really good backup to an average to below average starting catcher every day. And then he felt some of that too. Like he carried the weight of not doing very well at times, very heavily it affected his offense. And then he got hurt and we had to go get a guy that had not made the team that was just walking around campus and get him back to start against A&M the next week. So, I mean, it's having a, having a, a tough spot at the catch or, you know, not performing well there, that, that, trickles over to the pitching too. So that's, that's the one thing that I think they're going to have to guard against at that spot. But I, you know, I, I feel confident that once Ryland comes back, it'll help things quite a bit um, kind of spell Kimball and, you know, just kind of give him a, a breather really. Uh, hey, Drew, uh, speaking to Drew Bishop, uh, former uh, uh, at, uh, director of uh, player operations, I believe for baseball mm-hmm. now yeah. still involved, heavily involved with the program uh, in a kind of tangential way. Uh, follows the Longhorns extremely uh, heavily. Drew, I, I had a question for you, and, and this is yeah. just a, a – who is the next guy that's in the minor leagues that's a Longhorn that's going to be playing in the big leagues? I saw Dylan Campbell make a hell of a catch. Yeah. Um, I, I, next guy? I think, you know, it's probably going to be a race between Ivan Melendez and Ty Madden um, would probably be my guess. You know, I think those are um, – kind of hoping that selfishly I have them on some dynasty fantasy <laughs> leagues, but, um, but yeah, no, they, uh, I, I, Ty's had a good spring. It seems like, and, you know, I've been, you know, for, for the pitching, it's a lot easier to get up just because there's more opportunity, um, you know, and position guys, it just kind of depends upon who's in front of you and how they're doing and injuries and stuff like that. But I would guess it's probably one of those two guys. Um, but yeah, we've got a couple of guys knocking on the door. Um, you know, it's it's nice to have a, a healthier group of guys. You know, you've got Silas Arduan, I think, you know, I'd be shocked if he doesn't play in the big leagues. Um, so, I, yeah, I think some of those guys are going to have change. Mike Antico uh, has has had a good has had a good start to his minor league career. Um, 
Ah, uh, shoot, I'm probably forgetting someone, but yeah, it's it's it, it's tough because you know a lot of it, you know, you have to do well, but it also is very heavily dependent on who's in your organization. You know, I think I, I don't think people realize how much that matters uh, for the for for the most part when it comes to baseball and the minor leagues. Like, I mean, the easiest example to use is if you were a shortstop in the in the Yankees organization for about 20 years, you were kind of SOL there for a while, you know. And, <laughs> And yeah, you weren't you weren't beating out Derek Jeter. Right, right, right. <laughs> All right, hey Drew, thanks so much. Uh, you're going to be out at the dish tonight for the Washington game, and or okay, no, in it all? I'll I'll be at I'll be at a high school game like, uh, out here in Rockwell. Get the Rockwell versus Heath showdown. So got to be doing some work, but I'll have it I'll have it going on my phone, and then hopefully catch the end of it when I get home. So all right, all right, Drew Bishop, Bishop. thank you so much, Drew. You have a good one. Hook them, buddy. Yeah, you bet, guys. Hook them. We'll see you. Yep. All right, take care. That's Drew Bishop, uh, former director of player operations uh, for University of Texas baseball. Uh, Blake uh, and Jerry, what do you got, Jerry? Well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to I'm going to tell everybody about Chinook in a second, but I, I, for Blake. But I want to say this: Paul Skeens was only the second highest NIL earner in his relationship at LSU. <laughs> Congrats to Paul Skeens! All right, um, <laughs> that's, that's that true. Was really it's true. true. All right. I'm going to take a second to tell everybody about Chinook Cedary. I'm reading this one here. Uh, but baseball season is here, which means you have to have the essentials ready for those nine innings of fun, guys. And by that, I mean sunflower seeds. I, my kid used to have them all over his room, by the way. I'm sure other fathers have been the same way with that. There's a must when it comes to baseball, baseball and Chinook Cedary has you covered. With eight unique flavors to choose from, you'll definitely find a flavor you love, whether you're taking them on a camping trip to the ball game or on the wide open road. Chinook has crafted the best tasting sunflower seeds on the planet, and their unique flavors are made from real foods and spices. That means real Parmesan cheese, authentic hatched release, and freshly harvested dill. Whether you're actually in a game or just watching it, grab a bag of Chinook, Find them in your favorite store or go online to ChinookCedary.com. Any seeds the day and seeds the day with Chinook. Thank you, Jerry. I appreciate it. I don't think you got I it. all that out. All right, guys. <clears throat> let's uh, take some questions and yeah. let's do this one from yours, Barber. Which uh, Longmont, Longmont, Colorado, Bulletproof Coffee. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Which room has the best year on both sides of the ball? Which, Ooh, which well, I, you know what? I've got my first one's got to be. I've got to go with quarterback because that's the best quarterback room in the country. I can't, I can't not have quarterback. Um, I think quarterback's going to have a a very good year. Uh, third year starter in college football, and Quinn, the only third year starter back from the college football playoffs last year. Jalen Miller will be a second year starter. <clears throat> Arch Manning. The clear number two got a little bit of seasoning. He's going to get a lot this spring in the spring game. I think the Texas quarterback room is going to have a really good year. Bobby, this one's going to surprise people. I think the safety room is going to have a really good year at Texas. I think it's going to be the most improved position in the program. Now, they're going to be tested in a different way athletically than even last year. But Derek Williams, year two, Michael Taff returns. Andrew Makuba comes in, Jade Barron, that versatility. You have guys like Gilbo, Austin Jordan that could play nickel. Somebody could get a look at safety. You have Jelani McDonald in year two. You have freshmen like Xavier Phil Sami, uh, Jordan Johnson Bell. That room from a talent standpoint just went up a few notches. I think it's gonna that's gonna be the most improved position in the program. And anybody says running back room, I completely agree. I'm gonna I'm gonna be a little bit different. I, I go offensive line. Yeah. Uh, I think that they are the deepest position on the team. Uh, and, you know, I, I I think they have while, – while I agree that quarterback's a, a really good position, I don't know that they'll have necessarily the best year. I think if this team's going to be in the playoffs, it'll primarily be because of the offensive line being able to handle the defensive line. Agree, 100%. Okay, that, so that's me. Uh, and some people are mentioning the LB room here, like Christopher Weatherford. But my my thought process with the, the addition of Trey Moore is edge. You have two returning starters. You have two guys that have played a lot. 
uh, coming back as well. And then you add Trey Moore, who had 14 and a half sacks last year, as well as a freshman like Colin Simmons. I, I think Edge went from maybe being one of the biggest question marks on the team to maybe being the strength of the defense in one offseason. I, I hate right. to go straight like numbers because it's more than numbers, but what did the Edge position have last year in sacks total? What Burke had five and a half, uh, Sorrell had four, Jet Bush had a couple, right? I, so Finkley may have had a one and a half, maybe Tap had a half, right? So you're looking at 13-ish sacks as a, as a position last year. I think it's going to 20 this year. And I'd say this, it has to go to 20 this year. Got to get quarterbacks to the ground. Uh, the, the PFF pressure numbers are nice. Got to get quarterbacks to the ground. Got it. Hey, uh, other questions for you guys uh, and thoughts uh, that, I, that I want to get past uh, as it relates to some of this stuff. Uh, but before we do that, I want to say thank you to Josh Montoya. He had a super chat put in for Nick Shuley coming out on the show. We appreciate that. Uh, will we be able to see the recording of the live show? Yes, I believe that he said that that is going to be posted. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll follow up with Nick and make sure you guys know uh, if he's able to do it. Uh, Nick Shuley, third and Longhorn, good friend of ours and just a, a tremendous guy. Uh, let's go to Sandman. Should we worry about Ohio State coming after Tashard Choice? Look, I mean, why not? Why wouldn't you be worried except for one thing? You know, I don't think that that Texas is actually – look, if, if he gets a big offer, I think Texas will match it. I'll just put it that way. If well, not, when, it's it. when When all the Georgia rumors were, were out there about Georgia coming after a choice, I texted somebody and said they'd be very, very surprised if he lost Texas. Yeah. He, he, he likes Texas. That's where he, he played for the Cowboys, made some root – put down some roots here. Um, and you know what? I think that the bigger thing for me is that with Steve Sarkeesian, he's getting, it's not so much about pay for these guys. I mean, obviously money matters. I mean, nobody would ever say it doesn't, but Jerry, you and I noticed something this off season that, that rings true. He started being entering that inner circle yeah. of Steve Sarkeesian and Hey, come with me to help yeah. secure this recruit that has nothing to do with being a running back. Yeah. Right. Come, come with me and hang out with me down in South Florida while we go talk to Brandon Brown. You Lewis know, Gill, Michael Fasusi. Yes, yes, exactly. All those, all kinds of, those kinds of things are, yeah. are what matters. Yeah. Right. And so you're, is he going to get that with Ryan day, that kind of respect? I don't think so. And so if Texas, Look, and, and also Texas isn't Texas A&M. We don't lose our athletic director to Ohio State. So that's a different story. <laughs> that alone should make him stay. Yes, exactly. Is that plane that he sends to get Brian Bjork may turn, get turned or – oh, well, it won't now. It got turned, you know. You know. Yeah. All right, guys. Next question. Bobby. <laughs> um, uh, Zane Petty, I'm all in on taking Russell – and having two QBs in 2025. I think Russell can be a great college football QB. It helps with DK more and DFW recruits. What say you guys? And this is, you know, Texas already has a commitment from KJ Lacey out of Sarah Land in Alabama. It feels like to me, Jerry, people are overplaying this a little bit, the quarterback from Duncanville that Texas has reached out to a little bit. Uh, you, you feel like they're overplaying the idea of, of Keelan Russell right now, the quarterback at Duncanville, and making this a, a two QB class for Texas? I, I think that is uh, in you know that ball is in KJ's court. Now, KJ has April sixth unofficial visit, April twentieth the spring game, and June twenty first through twenty third official visit. He's got three visits set up with Texas. He you know Texas got him to cancel that visit to Ole Miss the late last week in January, early February, right? Uh, but that recruitment has continued. And that's not to say I don't think KJ – I think KJ wants to be at Texas. Um, I think that with Quinn, when Quinn returned, that bumped back Arch Manning's timeline, and that gave a lot of ammo to those that are still recruiting KJ Lacey. And for good reason. I mean, it, you know, for good reason. I mean, that, that's, that changes the timelines. The quarterback is the one position where the timelines really matter a lot. Because only one guy's on the field, and that guy has to get hurt for you to get a chance. I mean, so um, that that's a uh, – those are real timelines for families and a quarterback. Uh, but, look, Steve Sarkeesian has a great longstanding relationship with David Morse at QB Country. 
Arch Manning started training there in third grade. Um, I think uh, David Morse worked with Eli Manning at some points in Eli's college pro career. Uh, K.J. Lacey's been with him since third grade. There's a great relationships there. Texas has a great feel for that recruitment. I think what I think what Texas is doing is smart as well, though, in recruiting. You, you, you got to you got to keep recruit. If somebody's still taking a look at other places, you have to keep recruiting guys too. You can't get caught with zero at that position. Sark's not going to get caught with zero at the quarterback position. All right, Bobby, you ready to tell everybody out there about BKCW? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we talked earlier about the insurance trap. BKCW tries to take you out of the insurance trap where uh, your business's insurance agents are actually doing work for you, not just filling out order forms. Uh, they actually in involve themselves in actual risk management consulting, not just price quoting. Uh, operating out of their headquarters in Austin and owned by a UT grad, BKCW, uses a five-step process to identify your business's weak spots, design a plan, execute it, and monitor your situation throughout the year so that you can lower your insurance costs and effectively manage your company's risk. BKCW has already helped some of the most well-known construction companies, restaurant groups, breweries, and nonprofits in Central Texas uh, escape the insurance trap. And it all starts with a free risk assessment. Go to bkcw.com or send an email to info at bkcw.com to get started with a free risk assessment or claims audit and escape the insurance trap. That's bkcw.com. We really appreciate those guys for their ongoing sponsorship of On Texas Football and Coffee and Football. I didn't address a big part of that question beforehand. I don't think it'll be a two-quarterback class. Yeah, That's I don't need I mean, uh, Troy, Troy Hewn from uh, San Marcos Mission Hills is coming in April 6th. Um, oh, Jake Curtis. He's a 2026, too. 26. That's what I'm getting. Jack Curtis, the quarterback out of Nashville. Will Griffin out of Tampa in 26. They're all coming in April 6th, April 13th. If you take two quarterbacks in 25, you can pretty much kiss those guys goodbye. I, I don't think it'll be a two-quarterback class. I think Texas is, is ensuring they get one really good one. All right, guys. Next question here from Colton. And, Bobby, I'm going to let you read it. <laughs> uh, yep, absolutely. What concepts do you expect Johnny Nance and the new linebacker slash linebackers coach slash uh, co-defense coordinator to introduce to the defense in 2024. Hopefully he can provide some ideas to improve the back end against spread offenses. I don't know that he's going to be a, a back end guy. He's more of a front, a defensive front guy. So you may see a little, uh, some different pressures as, a, as it relates to this Colton, but I don't see anything happening differently on the back end. Jerry, you know, I, it, it is I, I, I will say this. It's interesting. So Jeff Choate was a co-defense coordinator, right? Along with Pete Witkowski. Now he brings in Johnny Nansen to be co-defense -co coordinator with Pete Witkowski. It's very interesting. All of those guys are defensive front guys more than they are back end guys. Yeah. I mean, Choate's been a linebacker coach forever when he wasn't a head coach. Uh, Nansen's been either a D-line coach or a linebackers coach almost his entire career. Yeah, I think uh, I think what will be interesting with the Texas defense from Big 12 to SEC, you have to be a little more aggressive in the Absolutely. SEC. Yeah. If you play, if you play bend, don't break, if you play off a lot of off coverage, if you don't bring more blitzes from different places, those athletes eat you up now. I mean, that's you can't do that. I mean, if, you can't do that against Lane Kiffin if you get in that game. Not if he's got a good offensive line. Um you can't – you're not going to be able to do that against Georgia. I mean, so I, I think it'll be interesting. So I think it, it – some people may look at it next year and say, yep, John, Nansen brought that. But I also think it's a combination of Texas is moving to the SEC. That It's a total different conference than the Big 12. You have to have more edge pressure. You have to put uh, those, those more talented offensive lines on their heels more in the SEC. If you don't do that, good luck, first of all. But then you have to you have to be a little more exotic in your blitz bracket packages, and you have to be a little more aggressive, else you'll get eaten up by the athletes. Next question from Sandman twenty three. Florida may actually finish next to Vandy football in the SEC's standings at season's end. Does Billy Napier even make it 
to Austin. I'm going to think about that. I don't know. I, my, I know that you're down on that program, but I'm telling you, I've seen it happen. One quarterback that just gives them an extra first down, yeah. and they beat Florida State last year. Yeah. Their talent isn't that far away. It's been right. their coaching and cohesion. Yeah. And Derek Lagway adds an element, if he's the starter or eventually takes over there, adds an element of being able to get an extra couple of first downs during a football game. So I, I don't know. I, I, I so, so look, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not as down on Florida as Jerry is. I do think, to Jerry's point, they have the most difficult schedule you're ever going to see in college football. Ever. And so that's my thing. It's just like, if you're in year three and your job's on the line and after year one and year two did not end well, I mean, good luck with that schedule. I can't tell people how important to me for, for if you're Florida, if you're looking at Florida's schedule, the Miami game is to start the season. If they lose that game, man, the rest of that schedule is daunting. And, and, and Miami, first year, first time, it's going to be a first year starting quarterback for Miami, Cam Moore. He may have a lot of experience. Florida has to win that first game at home against Miami. If they lose that game, just look at the rest of that schedule. I mean, like it's favorable in the first six, seven. But if you're not sitting there at what four, five, six, if you're not sitting at least at five and two after Kentucky, look at what's after that. They they have to be five and two after Kentucky. If they're not, look at November. Whoa, that may be the toughest. Georgia, Georgia Texas, LSU, Ole Miss, Florida State. Hey, they had some bravado to put that SEC championship. Yeah. That's a college football playoff right there. That's that's a there that's an NCAA tournament as a 10 seed having to win, beat Georgia, Texas, LSU, Ole Miss. I mean, just think about how hard that is in any sport. No, thank you. I I I would raise my hand and say no, thank you if I was Billy Napier. But then again, I'm not getting paid five million dollars a year to coach a football team. So to, to so to the uh, the uh, Point of the question is Billy Napier even in Austin? If he doesn't beat Miami and he doesn't beat Mike Elko in year one at a and those games at AM and those games are in Gainesville with what's after that on the schedule. I don't know. He better he 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 needs to win. He needs to beat Miami to start the year off right. All right. Next one, guys, from David Keith Williams. Hey David, uh, this one's to you, Jerry. You mentioned safety as being a good position group for UT in 24. I have questions about Andrew Makuba, who has been a nickel the past two years. So safety is first year. I think one of my things is, look, they got to answer the bell physically in, in, in the SEC, right? But I think versatility, speed, experience. I, I think I think they, they took a big step up. Now, I think they took a big step up uh, in, in at the safety position. I think McCoop is a really good cover guy, Bobby. I, I don't know about you, uh, but I, I think I think that is his strength, obviously, as a nickelback safety. Yeah, the the issue is is he. There have been some people that thinks he's think he may be a little soft. He's only 182 pounds. Okay, so we'll see what 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 happens. Uh, he is a he's a guy that had not made a lot of plays on the ball either which is a little concerning, but he's also a three-year starter yeah. on a team that's pretty been pretty salty. Not, yeah. not, it's not a throwaway football team, Clemson, even though they've had their, their struggles, uh, they're a good football program. So I, I, I think everybody, and the reason why you're, you're saying him, I think, I think they're good. I mean, I think he's a good player. The question, I don't think he's a first round draft pick. Right. I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to yep. uh, temper expectations, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, my my take on on this the safety position overall is how much experience they have coming back combined with guys that I think are NFL players. Like I think Derek Williams is an NFL player. I think Andrew Makuba is an NFL player. Um, Michael Taft may not be, but he's got a lot of experience now. Uh, you add in someone like Jelani McDonald, who has the so sort of athleticism he does. Xavier Filsamy is another guy that has that elite athleticism. And all of a sudden, you're building guys. You're building a room that that uh, looks pretty daunting and, and impressive, in my opinion. 
so I, I have no problem with with you going with the safeties as one of the top ones. All right, guys. Last question for today. It's from James Lee. Okay, James. Uh, would, what would you guys think if Sark wanted to bring in Norm Chow for another set of eyes on the off offensive side of the program? That's interesting. Norm Chow, I haven't heard that name in a long, long time. Uh, former USC offense coordinator, former, I mean, he coached, he coached Phillip Rivers at NC State, Steve Young at BYU. I mean, he had, he, that's a, that's one of the mothers of all invention with uh, Lavelle Edwards at BYU. Uh, whatever Steve Sarkeesian wants to do. Right now, I think Paul Christ still remains on staff, by the way, at Texas as an offensive analyst. I, I could be wrong on that, but as of uh, a couple weeks ago, I thought that was still the case. Patrick, Patrick Pays, uh, Page, we did talk about Colin Simmons uh, being the face of Texas. We kind of talked about that in his recruitment. Uh, I, I, think, I think Colin is super street smart. Um, and he understands everything in his sport, college football, recruiting, brand, everything around him and how to maximize that. And I think uh, the University of Texas has a outside of the football has an extremely strong appeal in that regard to him. If you know him and know his personality a little bit. And that's a great thing for Texas. Um, I absolutely do think he saw. He saw Kelvin Banks and what happened with Kelvin Banks and then what happened with Anthony Hill at Texas. And I think he can see the same thing for himself at the University of Texas. Yes. Good stuff, Thank Jerry. He's got to go get it done. Thanks, UT boy, for the uh, super chat. Hey, we need to say thank you to everybody today. Uh, we had a bunch of guests. We had two guests. Nick Shuley of 3rd and Longhorn joined us. Uh, we kidded him a little bit about his hair. Uh, but also talked a little bit about uh, some uh, interesting things that he's seen on third and Longhorn. Uh, we wish them the best of luck with that program. It's a terrific program if you get a chance. Uh, then also we had Drew Bishop, uh, the former uh, player operations director at, uh, for Texas baseball on to talk, talk a little Longhorn baseball. Uh, they host a three game set with Washington this weekend. Then we also want to say thank you to our sponsors. Uh, we're presented by every Friday BKCW insurance. Uh, also, Mando uh, came in to, to uh, sponsor today, as well as Chinook Cedary uh, in the, their sponsorship of the baseball segment as well. Uh, Blake, you were a uh, you 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 basically added, you, were, you you took it you took one for the team today. Uh, we know you have a little frog in your throat, but thank you, Jerry mm -hmm. Hamilton. Informative as always, uh, guys. Uh, we'll be back around one o'clock uh, for another live stream. Uh, but until then. We've literally got four days until spring football starts. Uh, we started the show with that discussion. Literally, uh, it starts at 9 a.m. next Tuesday. Guys, get back out on the football field. I can't wait for that uh, to happen. And, uh, and, and Blake, at baseball uh, tonight, you can only yep. clap. You can only, you're relegated <laughs> to clapping only. <laughs> no, yeah. if, if, even if your kid gets called out on a bad third strike, you just got to. <laughs> no yelling. No yelling at all. <laughs> All right, guys, y'all have a good one. Uh, that's going to do it for today's Coffee and Football for Jerry and Blake. I'm yes, Bobby Dante's world, UT boy. Yes. Hey, have a good weekend and hook them, guys. Seriously, hook them.